Um, thank you everyone for joining us today and welcome to the ultimate Black Friday Cyber Monday Crash Course webinar for e-commerce sellers. This webinar is brought to you by Payoneer, a global payments platform that helps entrepreneurs all over the world pay and get paid. Today, we're excited to share our panel of experts who will be taking us through what can help e-commerce sellers actually make the most out of this shopping holiday. So, you know, I think for, you know, myself, I'm not an e-commerce seller, but Black Friday, Cyber Monday is obviously a, an opportunity to get great deals. And if you're a seller making this, you know, um, the highlight of your year is obviously going to be important. We will have a Q&A at the end of the session, so do stick around for that. Um, you may also send us your questions during the session and we'll try our best to answer all of them. So we'll get started. Um, I'll introduce first Joshua Chin, um, who is co-founder and CEO of Kronos Agency. It's a data-driven e-commerce email marketing agency. Kronos' agency's clients enjoy an average of 35 times ROI on email marketing. And Josh and his team have worked with over 200 e-commerce clients to generate a 20 to 30% boost in trackable email revenue. So imagine what that can do for you during this shopping holiday. So Joshua, I turn over the table. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction. That's amazing. Uh, what's good, everyone? And uh, let me just begin by sharing my screen here. Is that okay? Perfect. So yeah, in this very short session, I hope to be able to share with you guys some of the key things that I think would benefit everyone uh, when implemented right away as soon as possible uh, in time for Black Friday and Cyber Monday. Uh, and I'm in a very fortunate position to have been uh, able to work with over 200 brands from all across the world, across different industries and niches. So there is um, a lot that I've seen and uh, a lot that my team have seen. And the stuff that I'm about to share with you guys are kind of basically firsthand information, things that we have tried and tested ourselves um, and not things that you can you know, necessarily Google online. So I hope that gives you a lot, uh, you know, a lot of value. Uh, so a little bit of a background from uh, just myself and who I am. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kronos Agency. My friends call me Josh. Uh, we are a Clavio Master Platinum partner that's the software that we use. It just means that we're really good at uh, basically delivering results with Clavio. We're also one of the top B2B companies listed on Clutch. Uh, global Asia in 2020, on average, our clients see an average increase of 20 to 30% in their revenue as a result of email. And that amounts to about 35x in client returns on our service. So that's something I was super proud of. Uh, nothing brings us more joy than seeing our clients and our brand succeed. So on average today, the strategy that we use generate an average of 5 million in monthly revenue for our clients. And it's only increasing as we grow. And last year alone, uh, during the BFCM week, we generated just over 800K in email trackable revenue. And that's done through 424 campaigns. Uh, and that amounts to about 23% of our clients' total store revenue. We're much, much more, uh, much more, much bigger as an agency today. And we know a lot more than we did back then. So we're expecting to uh, anywhere from eight to 10x this amount uh, this year. So that's going to be super exciting. We're creating way more campaigns as well. Uh, but we are also much more structured in the way that we uh, deliver the content. So I'm super excited by that. Now, um, so BFCM 2020 is going to be very, very different. And uh, stay tuned for Ho Young's session because he's going to give you guys some insights on what's happening with, uh, with, with traffic acquisition and, and Facebook. But this year's BFCM is going to be super, super fun. Um, with buying habits and preferences shifting as a result of COVID directly, social distancing measures in place, uh, for some businesses, some major businesses, Black Friday could even be a completely online event. Even retailers are shifting uh, in that direction. With what we're seeing in the US, especially, that's kind of a lot of people are kind of taking lead from what's happening over there. Uh, we are looking at, so with Adobe, 
they are looking at online sales revenue to grow by at least 20 to 50% more than previous years. Internally, we expect that to at least 2x of what we've seen uh, last year with the stuff, with the, with the clientele that we're dealing with in e-commerce and direct to consumer. Uh, so the question for, for you guys is, where are you currently at with your email marketing program? Uh, the goal here is to really set a about one third or 30% of your total store revenue should have email as a core touch point through which revenue should be flowing through. Cause that gives you a lot of, uh, a lot more margins and profits to play around with than it is for you to kind of completely rely on a single marketing channel uh, that you may not own completely. So email is something that's super powerful. 30% is a goal. Um, some of the results that we've seen uh, in with, with the clients that we work with, um, this on, on top, this is an Australian brand, uh, generating about 16 mil in 90 days and about 30%, 30% of that came through emails. And most importantly, one fourth, a quarter of that revenue, 25% or 4 million Aussie dollars is generated with automated campaigns and automated emails. Uh, and that's very, very, very impactful because that's something that's super scalable. And as you drive more traffic to your business, these emails will work even harder for you. Uh, and not to discount the fact that campaigns are delivering 5% of their total revenue as well. Uh, and at the bottom, we see a, an eight-figure brand as well, uh, generating about 36% of their total revenue with emails. So these are things that uh, any brand can definitely learn from. And I'm about to break down some of the top three uh, major lessons that we learned from 2019 that we're going to be implementing this year. Um, so number one, that's to get noticed early on. Um, you don't have to be waiting for BFCM or the week of BFCM even to start making your customers excited for what's about to happen. The way you can start is to firstly offer something of value uh, to get the early opt-ins for, uh, for your list with website pop-ups for the BFCM sale. Uh, we do this as soon as possible so that potential prospects and potential customers, even if they're not ready to purchase right away, they know that BFCM is coming up and the, the messaging allows them to kind of get a hint of what's to happen next. Um, and then we couple that up with pre-hype builder campaigns. Essentially, this campaign has the sole purpose and sole intention of creating attention and creating curiosity, building the hype, letting them know that discounts are coming, but not now, not yet. And one of the ways that you can uh, kind of capture that attention, all right, is to begin by getting people to add stuff to their wish list, right? If you have, uh, you know, if, if you're if, if you have customer accounts on your site, what you can get people to start doing is to add products to their wish list. Start recommending products based on what they uh, have viewed in the past, what they have bought in the past, interest groups. Start creating segments that make sense to your audience and start uh, recommending products for them to you know, initiate that, that consideration phase so that when the discounting happens, the conversions will happen much, much easier. And next, beat the noise. Um, you know, test out alternatives, alternative send times. Don't stick to the same exact send time. Uh, things might surprise you. We typically, we traditionally looked at 7 to 9 a.m. being the golden hours, especially for audiences that are uh, older and working. They would typically look at their emails either first thing in the morning or on their commute on the way to work or first thing at work, right? So this is you know, traditionally where we would kind of uh, line up most of our emails, 7, 9 a.m. But recently what we did was to test out the non kind of golden hours. And what we found was in a series of, a series of A-B tests, split tests, we found that the later timings right, the later timings actually generated higher revenues uh, and more placed orders per campaign as compared to the ones uh, at an earlier timing. So really the lesson of this is to not make any assumptions, make sure you're testing things out on a side-by-side -side split test. Uh, and, you know, when you get, if you don't have enough 
data to conclude that split test just conducted again. We did three AB tests for this same hypothesis in a single month to make that conclusion. So uh, to give you kind of an overall picture of how you can position your initial uh, prospecting sequence, we call this the customer acquisition sequence. Um, and kind of just prioritizing what is key for that conversion to happen. For most brands, it's gonna be a discount code and that's totally okay, right? And I, um, not every brand is gonna uh, be using a discount code right off the bat and that's totally okay. All you gotta do is reposition the, uh, the messaging a little bit. And instead of a discount code, you might wanna be using a free ebook or a guide or some kind of uh, value-driven content, all right? So have a look at this, take a screenshot. I'm not gonna go through <laughs> this too much because there's a lot more on the cover. And um, so you might be thinking, all right, what, what's, the, you know, what's the best framework I could be using for uh, a first sales email? We get that a lot, and I just wanna break down exactly what that looks like for, for us. This is one of the most common frameworks that we use internally. It's nothing, it's nothing fancy, it's nothing complicated, but it really follows a very set structure of what we know to be true. Uh, we always start with a, with a branded headline, right? We start with the logo. Uh, we start with a headline and the core message. Uh, in this case, if it's sales email, it's typically a discount, right? Month end sale or end of month sale. Um, we also use a moving graphic or a GIF or a GIF, whatever you call it, um, to kind of get people's attention to where they need to click essentially. Uh, and that's exactly where we want them, where we want their eyes to go to, the discount code, right? And then the CTA button. Something I would even change is just the, 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 the word itself. Find out is not super, uh, it, it's not super uh, compelling. Um, so I would test out multiple variants of the CTA even. And then it doesn't end there, right? So on the left-hand side, you see what's above the fold before someone scrolls down in their email. In the second half of the email, that should contain product recommendations, uh, as well as your typical unsubscribe buttons. Adding product recommendations, super, super useful, very easy to do, and it gives people a reason to click. The second part, uh, build hype, maximizing attention. Uh, you definitely wanna use this as an opportunity to lock in sales and get people's excitement ready before they even have the opportunity to buy. One of the ways we do that, just continuing on, on what we talked about, building hype, one of the really, really amazing ways you can do this to build hype is instead of an add to cart type of CTA, like buy now or click here, we use an add to calendar CTA so that the notification now lives on the person's, the subscriber's calendar instead of their inbox, which is gonna be bombarded with messages come Black Friday and Cyber Monday. So add to calendar is something that I would recommend you guys do. Uh, very, very useful. Next, incentivize people with opt-ins. Give them a good reason, right? Why should I give you my email again? Why should I pay attention? Give them a good reason. That could be a discount. That could be a bundle. That could be a unique offer that people care for um, or some kind of a value-added offer. And then I would look at building a VIP list of customers that have shown clear signs of conversion, either in the past, interest, uh, in the recent uh, months coming up to BFCM, uh, as, as well as um, some type of prediction, right? With Clavio, there are predictive analytic uh, features that you can leverage on, but it's as simple as just creating um, segmentations based on what people prefer. One of the options here is kind of just creating a self opt in list, right? Getting people to opt in and to basically indicate that they are interested in being notified when the sale comes. Um, you can also include high value customers who purchased uh, frequently or recently. In this case, we're looking at people who have made a purchase at least three times over all time. Um, and we also create messaging emails that are you know, specifically to build that VIP list. Uh, and the value proposition here is pretty simple. It's convenience, is it's exclusivity because the discounts that you be, you're going to be getting as part of the VIP list is going to be higher than the uh, the rest of the crowd. Uh, you also get an edge over other other shoppers on some of our most limited edition products, right? And that's that's super powerful. 
And lastly, maximizing conversions with psychological triggers, give them that extra push that they need. Uh, number one, countdown timers, it still works extremely well, especially at the beginning and at the closing part of the sale process. Something else that we do is uh, kind of counterintuitive, uh, which is a thank you email. Right, the thank you email is done at the end of the event. It's, a, it's kind of a closure kind of thing. It bolsters the relationship and it does not sell anything, right? It doesn't offer anything at all. It's just a pure, hey, thank you so much for being a part of uh, this event. You know, as a, as a family, I would like to thank you so much for supporting us and we look forward to serving you in the next one. And that's it. That's, that's it. But it creates a good segue into what's about to come next, right? With your other content emails and it doesn't leave people hanging on, hey, so what, what happened with the, the, the sale? And if you'd like to, if you want to, before the thank you email, you can also give people a surprise, right? If you feel that there's a little bit uh, of opportunity you could uh, uh, use for conversions, throw in a surprise sales extension just for people who have opened your emails, clicked your emails, but have not converted in that specific period of time. Uh, that's something we do quite a bit, uh, but it really depends on your brand, uh, your, your brand and your marketing strategy user-generated content, uh, as well as product usage. Uh, emails, super, super powerful stuff. Helping people envision what it's like to experience the product is extremely, extremely powerful, right? User-generated content is also something that's super easy to create. It is incredible, right? This is obviously a little bit edited, but you can always screenshot something out of Instagram and use that as part of your email. And that works just as well because it's organic, it's dirty, people buy into that. Something else that I would recommend checking out is turning a customer testimonial video or an influencer video into an email, right? This is not a, this is not a video that people can play in the email, right? When they click on this, it sends people to a landing page where the video plays and where the, the product uh block is placed and, and all that stuff. So it goes to a landing page with the product information and all that. I would add an overlay play button as well, just to increase the click rates that has shown to be super effective as well as moving faces, moving human faces, incredibly, incredibly powerful. So content emails, just as powerful, just as powerful as sales emails when done in the right way, especially when you're leveraging uh, reviews and content driven user generated stuff. So ultimately, these are some of the ideas that you can use to create some FOMO during the sales process, customer testimonials, usage, how people use it, earn authority, awards, um, reviews, as well as press mentions. And that's it. So if you guys enjoyed this, uh, I got a little surprise for all of you. Use this link or this QR code, download this freebie. Uh, it, there's nothing to sell. It's, it's, all, it's all value inside 20 plus pages of just checklist, what we've done, uh, additional tips that could help with the FCM. So all the best. And if you like what you've seen and you'd like to have a conversation with me, um, this is how you could get in touch with me. This is a link to a strategy session uh, with my team. This is my contact information. And if you'd like to see more free content, more premium training, this is our Facebook group. Just Google e-commerce email lab on Facebook and you'll find us. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joshua. I think there, with the amount of questions we're getting, you know, I think we're going to have a very interesting Q&A. But before we go there, we will, in, you know, go through, you know, that very interesting topic on, okay, now we have an idea of how we might go about our email marketing during this holiday period now where how can i use ad pricing then that's why we have hoyong who is one of the founding members and head of projects of ad expert so ad expert helps e-commerce businesses scale their ads and build global brands um, and as a facebook china export partner at Expert is creating brand stories, strategies, and campaigns for greater China businesses, creating international brands loved by the world. So, Hoyong, you know.
Hi guys, can you hear me now? Great, cool. Um, thanks for the intro and um, Josh is really the man for email. What, um, what a good presentation. And I think there's a lot of salient tips that a lot of you know, uh, starting e-commerce uh, folks can take on for email marketing. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ho Yong and um, I'm the founding member of Expert. And I think today's topic is uh, very uh, relevant and salient, right? Uh, I'm not going to talk much about how to, you know, um, do ad buy or the different CDO tactics you have because I think there are a lot of experts out there uh, or you have different strategies they're using today. But I think today's topic is something that is extremely relevant, especially today. Because I think um, usually I have a routine whereby I wake up at about 8.30 a.m. in the morning. But today I, I was rudely awakened at about 7 a.m. by a series of emails uh, from my inbox coming from Facebook your ad account has been disapproved for policy violation. I think I got almost uh, out for my agency about 50 emails today. So, uh, so that's a huge amount, right? Uh, but fortunately for us, we got most of it back within about two to three hours. And, and that's very lucky, right? And, and, and I think that's why today's topic, uh, it's not about how you uh, position your ad strategy, because I think amongst uh, many of you, maybe you are even a bigger expert than us. But I think the thing I want to cover today is how to safely scale Facebook ads for Q4 2020. Because if you can't even safely run Facebook ads, then there's, it's very hard for you to scale and achieve good results for e-commerce, especially in Q4. So maybe before I go to the topic proper, I'll just have a quick introduction about Expert. So Expert uh, is a Facebook China export partner. So we are primarily based in Shenzhen. And we actually serve a lot of clients from the greater China region, um, focusing on um, Shopify branded stores and also crowdfunding. Um, we partner with uh, Indiegogo and Kickstarter, and one of our recent campaign, um, our, our recent campaign actually raised about 1.5 million via Kickstarter. So that's actually our focus primarily. But we also have many uh, folks that are on the beginning journey of building a branded store, um, maybe doing dropshipping currently, and that's where our expertise come in in terms of helping them navigate the policies and giving them some scaling advice. So a bit about myself, um, I'm. As, as mentioned earlier, I'm the founding member of Expert. And before I was a founding member of Expert, I was actually an ex-Facebooker. I actually worked in Singapore, uh, Asia headquarters, and I was the partner manager for China SMB market. And I published some white paper about B2B and cross-border e-commerce using Shopify and spoke at about 100 plus Facebook marketing events. Um, so there, that's the background of myself. So today's sharing will be both uh, practical experience that I have running my agency, uh, learning about the policy, and also some um, I won't call it trade secret, but some of the inner workings of how Facebook evaluate policy so that you know how to navigate um, the landscape uh, coming forward in Q4 or even moving beyond Q4. So maybe, okay, before I start, right, or maybe using comment or the section, any of y'all were running Facebook ads and got your ad account disapproved the last week. Um, is it possible to, you know, say maybe um, one in the comment? I'm not sure how whether it works on Zoom. Let me see. Yes, just today, client X got banned. Um, that's the story of our life, I guess. So um, today, uh, I think most of us are running e-commerce today, so I'm going to share more about e-commerce uh, practical experience. So I think the first one is third-party infringement, and the example I give here is very obvious, right? It's um, Adidas uh, sweater. So even if you're not using the actual brand, you're using something similar, it actually flags Facebook algorithm uh, very quickly. If you're looking using logo, ad sets, personalities, or symbols, those are the things that flag the system very quickly. And when you think about appealing an ad account, right? A lot of times when you appeal an ad account, you don't get it back. And then you know you go to chat support, you email, and then you 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 get a lot of uh, rejection. Actually, most of the time there is a real reason behind why you got rejected. And sometimes um you think that oh it's not infringement, but it's actually in fact an infringement. So one example I want to illustrate, or one discussion point I want to talk about is that. Um, if the content is on landing page, do you think, let's say, for example, this Abibus t-shirt is on the landing page, but you're actually selling the shots. If this content is on the landing page, do you think you have contravened Facebook policy? Um, maybe you can answer it yourself or you can answer it in the comment section above as well. Um, yeah, so actually, the answer is even if the, the material that you have that infringe the policy is not on the ad, means it's not on the Facebook platform, you never use it to run ads, it's on your landing page. It actually also contributes Facebook policy and your ad can be taken down, your ad account can be taken down as well. The second question I have is that if you use a competitive video or picture, would that be considered third-party infringement? Um, you guys can maybe you know think about it, whether it's some infringement. 
but I can tell you that it's definitely an infringement. Um, so I have a client, um, very nice guy uh, from, uh, from, from China, so starting on um, their job shop dropshipping journey. So I think they managed to scale their store to about uh, 1 million ad spend per quarter. And they use use mostly in-house ad sets. But they just took one video of a competitor, um, once to one, um, and, and ran ads. And their whole store got taken down. And it was almost virtually impossible for them to get the store back uh, because it's a third-party infringement. So um, a lot of a lot of folks in the beginning, if you are using um, dropshipping methods or, or you are using other other um, competitors' asset, what I recommend is that to at least drastically edit the video or asset such that it does not look like the original version anymore. Regardless whether you're using it on Facebook ads, regardless regardless whether you're using it on landing page, it has to look drastically different for you to use a competitors' asset. Otherwise, uh, you're opening yourself up to a huge amount of risk. Uh, and even if you only copy one picture of a competitor's site uh, and put it on your landing page or your e-commerce store, not on your ads, this is something that Facebook can add on as well and disable the ad account. So this is something I'll maybe in the, at the start uh, give you an introduction about how what assets Facebook look at in terms of the infringement. They don't look only at your ads on your ads manager. They look at your landing page as well. Um, this might go a bit counterintuitive to what Josh mentioned because I think for email, I think that's a great uh, avenue for you to, you know, use your, if you're starting out, use your competitor asset. But at least on Facebook and your online landing page, this is something that Facebook is very strict on. Um, okay, next. Uh, I think this is another third party infringement. Um, this is more obvious, right? On the left, you see Gucci. But uh, another store that uh, our, um, our, our um, client got disabled was this, um, similar to this, which was a, a phone um, phone case of um, a brand. I think most of us in Asia will know that this from Line is a, it's a bare uh, in phone case from Line. But let's say, for example, you are in a country, you see a ruined product. You're not sure whether this is actually a brand or any. IP asset from another brand. It's always better to double check because maybe the product that you're testing is not even a winning product. It's not even the product that's driving revenue for your store. But just because you're running that IP infringement product, you'll cause your whole store takedown. It's not very worth it in the long run for uh, sustainable e-commerce. Mm, okay, another third party infringement, I think uh, is about personal personality imagery. Uh, it's definitely not allowed. And re it's regardless of how popular the person is. And I think here I have a small case study that I want to share. So we have um, another client selling bathing material. Uh, and it illustrates sort of how, you know, the bathing materials, uh, especially the pillow, help to, you know, keep um, this. Uh, it's very good for your spine. It, it, it gives you energy and stuff like that. And then within the, I think, one-minute video that they have, um, there's a three-second snippet of a Thailand martial artist that they use as a stock stock video. They thought it was a stock video, but it's not a stock video. But that three-second snippet caused the whole ad account to be shut across um, the multiple um, stores across Europe. And that's, that's just one small third-party infringement. So if you think about third-party infringement, uh, especially for personality, uh, it's definitely not worthwhile, uh, especially if you are using it just as a stock video or picture. And, and once again, it applies both on your ads and also on your landing page. Um, I think one question that um, usually comes up is that, who uh, will, the, uh, will I only be acted upon if uh, the third party, which is the, the party that you have infringed on, report against you? So I think this, um, this difference in terms of uh, reporting usually happens in two areas. The first area is that, let's say if you steal a competitor's or, or you, you copy a competitor's uh, ad creative or, or, or asset, usually the third party infringement is actually enforced by the competitor. They will say that, oh, this person has used my creative, this person has used my asset and Facebook will act on it. If you're talking about main brands, big brands or personality, usually you'll be reported or you'll be flagged by Facebook uh, manual review. So regardless which you know party is reporting your third-party infringement, uh, it's never worthwhile, I think, in the long run, especially if you are building a long-run e-commerce store to infringe this because it's something that is relatively easy to avoid, in my opinion. Okay, and I, I think the next part I want to talk about is some product restrictions. I think uh, most of the time when we are, you know, early on our e-commerce journey, we will look for the winning products of other stores. But there are actually some products that are 
to us, maybe as a consumer or, or someone that's new to e-commerce, it might not look like a clear violation. There's also no clear statement that it's a violation. But um, these are just some product restrictions that uh, we have seen. So for example, first of all, is a spy camera. Actually, spy camera is nothing, or even a camera within a backpack, it's nothing really illegal. Uh, it's, it's not something that you cannot sell, but Facebook must not allow. Um, or once they see an ad selling a spy camera, they usually take it down. Uh, automotive illegal tampering device, uh, illegal set-top box. These are the things that um, maybe in the country you're in, um, there's no jurisdiction over it. Uh, it might not even be an illegal product. But I think end of the day, you can perform a very simple sanity test. If the product can be used in an um, uh, illegal way or unauthorized way, then it will be probably something that Facebook will take down. So um, this, once again, is another practical experience that happened to one of our client's store. Um, general store once again do, doing electronics and they just had a they were just testing a product uh, of a spy camera on, on the back and the whole store got taken down because of one product um, and maybe at this point of time I want to talk a bit about Facebook review system right? um, if you have um, your ad account got disabled or your ad got disabled and you have no violation uh, or you follow the rules very clearly most of the time you do get your ad account back um, this from my experience as, as an agency and also from my previous experience at Facebook. But if you have one uh, ad or ad account or, or, or asset that really indeed contribute Facebook policy, it, it becomes a lot harder. And, and of course, sometimes there are some cases whereby, oh, you know, I contribute a policy, I appeal, I still get it back. So I think the difference is that the policy that you contribute varies in terms of uh, degree of severity. Some policies that you uh, contribute are very, very uh, minor. For example, let's say you use um, you put a five star um, image on your ad and, and it's a fake validation. But some violations are a lot more serious. So for example, something like spy camera or illegal set top box, what Facebook will deem to be no, then uh, even if you have only one ad that's approved, you won't get it back. So in general, if you're talking about appealing uh, or how to, how to appeal for your ad account, you really have to, our, our strategy for our account manager is that we will look at the ad account and we will understand ourselves what is the violation and whether it's severe or minor. And, and I think that's something that as an um, e-commerce um, business owner, you have to understand the, the policy, especially because you are you know, running so much ads on the platform. You need to know what risk you're taking and uh, whether you, the risk you're taking is worthwhile or not. Um, this is uh, exaggerated, exaggerated sales tactics. I think uh, before, after, like the one on the right, it's something that is very obvious. Uh, most people will know. Uh, but uh, the one on the left might be a bit uh, more obscure, um, it's, which is a zooming poly parts. So this picture on the left, even though it's showing a guy with a very chiseled six packs, which I don't have. <laughs> Maybe Josh has one. Uh, uh, it's actually a bit, you know, sexual. But because he shows his, you know, his face uh, and the whole, overall the whole body. So this is actually policy compliant. But if you have an asset that shows and zoom in on a certain part of the body, for example, the picture on the right, this becomes policy not compliant. So I think it's really a fine line. And, and once again, this applies not only on your ads, uh, be it the video or a photo, it applies on your landing page as well. So these are some things that you have to take a look. Uh, maybe just once again referring to what Josh mentioned earlier, like for example, the email about user review. I think that's a great, I think like um, that's a great, um, you know, um, email or asset to show like the eyeliner, but the same asset can't be used on Facebook because it's zoom in. So um, you need to know how to play the game well. Of course, such um, more zoom in assets before or after assets are great for conversion. And I think those are the things that you can use on email or uh, on, on, on other uh, platforms or maybe even on um, some areas of a landing page. But if you're running ads through Facebook and the landing page for the ad, it definitely cannot contain such information. Otherwise, you'll be flagged as a uh, policy not compliant. I think this uh, next section is more of the impossible products. I, most of the time, as you know, e-commerce beginner business owner, you try to look for the winner products, and most of the time, impossible products tends to uh, tends to be the winner. Like you know, um, after you wear this uh, toe sock, you will solve your binding issue. And after you consume this fish oil, you will you know prevent cancer or have a 
very exaggerated very fine feedback. I think those are the products that you know indeed have good conversion. But if you're talking about scalable, sustainable e-commerce business, I think these are the products that you definitely have to avoid because these are the products that are too good to be true. And Facebook have become very intelligent about detecting such products. Um, this is just another example of some impossible products, healthcare and beauty. Um, I think there are some areas of beauty where, but of course, it's possible. Uh, personally, I don't use beauty products, so I'm not sure what sort of products that will be. But um, there are some products that you want to show before, after. You want to show, um, you want to show the effect of the product. You you can't exaggerate and have very strong claims that this product will do miracles. You can maybe have user-generated reviews um, that show the improvement across time, but not a very exaggerated like um, speed up videos or just direct before after comparison. So I think that's where beauty products becomes a bit more tricky, especially now when you're doing Facebook ads. You can't just use the very direct sort of um, response sort of ads. You need to build the funnel uh, a lot deeper. You need to build the awareness. You need to have the user generated review. And I think that's one area that will only become increasingly more difficult, especially for Facebook ads acquisition if you do not have a established brand already. This next part, I think, is the part that most people uh, fall for. Um, it's the fake validation tool. I think, I think uh, there are a lot of e-commerce stores that are still um, having this issue. Um, I think maybe two, three years ago, this was not an issue on Facebook, but it has become a huge flag for Facebook. So, for example, one on the left has a rating of five star on the app itself. This is something that's not allowed, regardless whether it's on the app, the video asset, or on the landing page, because uh, it's a fake validation. And, and Facebook has no way to verify whether your product or your store really indeed have a five star review. Another, um, sorry, this on in Chinese, but um, the, the one at the bottom is a sales countdown timer. The one on the right is a user review that is very exaggerated. So I think um, validation tool, um, when you're starting out on e-commerce, you'll install some of these apps on your Shopify store. Um, these are some things that Facebook really flex quite easily now. Um, you will not get banned immediately. I think this is where I want to raise another point, is that most of the time, if you do one of the, maybe one of the many things I've discussed above or in the following area, you won't get disabled. And then you're like, oh, actually, I can do it. Because, I mean, even though Ho-Yong said that uh, these are against Facebook policy, I did it and I didn't get banned. It happens a lot. Um, why so? It's because Facebook do not ban you on a single indicator. Facebook bans your ad account or ads on a basket of indicator. Let's say, for example, you have to meet a certain threshold of, let's say, three indicators. Facebook will flag the account up for review and they'll ban you. So, um, fake validation tool is something that you know most people use, and then they say, "Oh, like it's been going well for me. Why can't I use it?" But it's something that will increase the uh, heightened scrutiny on your account, and you have to balance whether the increased conversion is worth the heightened scrutiny because the heightened scrutiny will just mean that you cannot run your ads stably, especially if you deflect your account for this evil. Okay, some other policy issues here. Um, they are a bit more obscure. I think on the right is a bit more direct. It's just basically uh, the website can't be found. And uh, we had a few cases whereby when um, the Shopify was down, the website can't be found, and, and the client was running a lot of traffic, then the ad account got disabled because Facebook thinks that um, we were trying to run um, some scam by running to a 404 website. Um, on the left, um, I think this one is just, uh, if you have been listening to my um, talk earlier, it's actually a zoom in. Uh, aspect of the app, um, you can probably show, let's say if you're selling laundry or bikini, you can show a figure of the whole person, including the head, so that you will not flag or zoom in um, uh, body assets. Here and here, uh, of course, first of all, this is um, branded good uh, and should not be, um, this is IP infringement, but the infringement, another infringement here is that 50% of uh, here, so, um, of course, um, a lot of folks will say, oh, I, I usually have a 60% off, 70% off to attract eyeballs and to, to increase conversion. Uh, but Facebook actually has a magic number whereby, let's say, if you are above a certain percentage off for your ads or your landing page uh, in a certain proportion on your website, then Facebook will flag your ad account or your landing page 
as a high risk turning pitch. So it usually is very dynamic. So it ranges from about 25 to 45%, depending on the overall market um, uh, percentage of discount. But this is something that most people will get flagged very easily because you have 50% discount across your whole store. So what I usually recommend is for clients to keep their discount below 30% in general and only have a few products that are above uh, 50% because Facebook easily flag your store for this. And I, I think this is especially uh, important when you're starting out because you might be only running one or two winners, but your whole store is 50, 60%, 70% discount. And that becomes a very easy flag for Facebook. And that's something that's not very worthwhile if you're running e-commerce in the long run. Uh, I, I've went through most of the things that I can cover uh, as, as my role as a China agency partner, um, a founding member. But I think there are some key recaps that I want to go through here um, that will hopefully be able to keep you very safe in Q4. First of all, is that all your assets are considered. Don't only you know, uh, optimize uh, or make your video or picture on your Facebook app policy compliant because your landing page will be reviewed by Facebook as well. Second is that, um, and this relates more of the product side, is if it's not real and you don't believe it as well, don't sell or, mar or market it. Uh, this, this will become increasingly difficult moving forward because Facebook already know what category of products dropkeepers uh, have very uh, exaggerated claims. Uh, those products are really like very high, very, very easy for Facebook to flag. So I don't think it's worthwhile, especially if, you're, if you want to build a long-term e-commerce brand or have a long-term e-commerce store. Um, the, unfortunately, I think um, despite uh, you know everyone wanting Facebook to be less harsh on them in policy front, it will only become harder to comply and never easier. So when I was Facebook, I think about one and a half years ago, I thought that policy was really uh, incredibly difficult for e-commerce store, especially those at the beginning to, to scale. But after one year in the market, it has only become harder. It will not become easier. So what I will recommend you to do is to comply with the policy and maybe even um, constantly evaluate whether what are things that might be flagged for Facebook. And I think that's a very great exercise because you know in advance what might be risky and you can identify those. And when you review, when you send your account for account review, you already tell the reviewer that, oh no, I know that this might be risky, I've removed it. If you know what you are wrong, then it becomes a lot easier moving forward. Um, and the last thing that I want to talk about is that Facebook policy is dynamic and not static. Uh, you have to adapt and you have to adapt quickly. Um, there are a lot of clients that we work with that will always say, oh, you know, just last week, I could do this. Why can't I do this now? Um, unfortunately, we are running ads on the platform and we have to follow the rules of the platform, follow the rules of the game. And um, it always helps to move faster and to move ahead of the platform so that you can avoid being tied down by policy issues. You rather you rather be able to scale across all 12 months than to you know have one or two months of heightened sales and then and have a huge drop because of a Facebook disable. I think that's very important, especially if you're looking at a long-term sustainable e-commerce uh, brand that you're building. So I don't have a lot of other gold nuggets to share. Uh, um, but if you have any, you know, policy issues, oh, no, no, sorry. You can't find me if you have policy issues because I'm not logged on Facebook. <laughs> I, oh, that's, a, that's a, you know, or something that I usually say when I go for a Facebook event previously, but please do not find me if you have any Facebook policy issue. But if you, have, if you want to chat about, you know, how to have a long-term sustainable brand and you're doing huge numbers and you just can't, for the, uh, for the sake of, for the, love, for the love of God, figure out what Facebook is trying to uh, penalize you for, you can drop us an email, we can take a look and we can have a chat there. Happy to have a chat there. So yeah, thanks so much, guys. Thanks, William. So I hope that, you know, you guys were able to get a lot from that session. So we have last but not least, we're also joined by Britsy Kapili. She's the Senior Sales Manager for Southeast Asia for Payoneer. So if you're doing cross-border selling, you will need a payment platform like Payoneer. And Britzy, Britzy is amazing at enabling new clients make the most out of her payment services. So before we go into our Q&A, um, Britzy has a few slides to share with you. Thanks, Eileen. Um, okay, I'll, I'll start to share my screen now, just a moment.
Great. Can you guys see my screen, the full yep. screen? All right. Thanks, Thank you again, Eileen, for the intro. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ritzy from the Pay in Your Southeast Asia team. Thank you again for joining our session today. I hope you've learned a lot from our expert speakers on how to increase conversions for email marketing and how you can safely scale um, your ads on Facebook, right? So we're down to the last stretch of the session today before the Q&A. Uh, I'm here to talk about how you can simplify and optimize your international B2B payments for your e-commerce business. Are you excited to learn about the best kept secrets of six to seven figure e-commerce sellers on how to maximize their profits? You guessed it right. It's all about how you can optimize your B2B payments and how they're able to you know, cut down the fees and simplify how they make uh, payments to all of their suppliers, vendors, and other business partners. And we at Payoneer can help you do just that. So to kick things, to kick things off, let me briefly introduce who we are, the key challenges of e-com sellers that we see, and how we can help. I'll also talk a little bit more on how the Payoneer solution works and also share with you guys the special program for our e-commerce sellers. Now here at Payoneer, our mission has always been to empower business owners around the world with world-class financial solutions to capture the opportunities of the global market. We're actually 1,600 team globally with over 20 plus offices um, in over 200 plus countries. And up to date, we serve over 4 million customers worldwide in 35 languages. I myself am part of uh, the Manila office, which helps take care of our Southeast Asian clients. For over a decade, Payoneer has built a robust and innovative payments platform to serve customers of all sizes for their cross-border needs. This is why thousands of global marketplaces and digital platforms uh, choose Payoneer as their payments partner, uh, including the likes of the guys at Amazon, Google, Walmart, Lazada, Shopee, and many other global brands. And as we grow, of course, we're making sure that our customers are, are well taken care of 24 seven uh, in your local communities and in your languages as well. And I'm very proud to say that we're here to make an impact on every entrepreneur's journey. But enough about us, let's talk about you. What are the key challenges that you're facing in your e-commerce business? What stresses you over the most? And as we serve more e-commerce sellers in the region, we've learned that there are quite a few things that you deeply care about, whether it's finding and selling winning products, getting more eyeballs and increasing conversion rates for your stores, making sure that your customer is happy, keeping your cash flow, cash flow moving, and of course, maximizing profit for your business, right? And when you think about it, there are a lot of factors in play when you talk about maximizing your profit. But at the end of the day, we see that the chunk of it all comes down to how you're able to manage your payments from pay-ins to pay-outs. You know, managing cross-border payments is not as easy as it looks. And we know because our customers will tell us that they have four major headaches when it comes to managing their international B2B payments. Uh, you're all familiar with it, but there are high fees, a lot of currency conversion loss, a lot of restrictions and lack of flexibility when managing cash flow, delays, be it in shipments or in your payments, and taxes, of course, a pretty controversial topic, but let's leave it for another session. Now, considering all these challenges, maybe newer sellers might experience a different expectation versus the reality, right? I mean, when you were getting started, did you ever think that, 
oh, I'm going to find a winning product and I'm going to make seven figures per month. Or let's say my product is the best and I'm sure my conversion rate will be great. Or maybe you've thought, oh, my payment solutions will work very well. Or even worse, maybe you're going to say, oh, I'm going to break even in just one year and increase my profit ma margin in the next couple of years. I know, I know. Did I sound just like a madman? <laughs> now, let me go back to reality now. I mean, I'm sure many of you uh, experienced sellers will tell me that, hey, Britsy, a winning product cannot sustain you most of the time they're seasonal and to scale you need to double triple quadruple or in general just sell more winning products or maybe you'll tell me oh facebook's shut down my campaigns again or my shipments are delayed what the hell covid right or even worse in terms of payments maybe you'll say did I just get charged with a 5% conversion fee just to pay my Chinese supplier? Or are my funds on hold again? And, you know, each of these issues, uh, at least to say, will make you feel overwhelmed. I know it's a lot to take in. But what if there's a way? What if you can actually save more and simplify how you manage your cross-border payments? What if you can reduce fees and currency conversion as much as possible or easily make supplier payments at lower cost? And what if you can even enjoy free payments, right? If that's even possible and manage all your payments in one secure place. And this is where Payoneer can help. Whether you're a marketplace seller or a direct e-commerce brand seller, Payoneer can easily help you collect uh, your cross-border payments to your multi-currency receiving accounts with us and help you manage your cash flow better, be it paying yourself, uh, your overseas suppliers, your vendors, or your business like Facebook, Google, or even uh, trusted service providers like Hoyoung and Josh, right? All of these while saving more for your business. Here's a simple pay-in and pay-out flow that our clients enjoy right now. Um, they receive from marketplaces or transfer funds from gateways like PayPal or Stripe US. They receive it in their multi-currency account in Payoneer for free in one to two business days. And from there, they can easily manage their payouts to themselves, their suppliers, uh, using their Payoneer card to pay Facebook or Google, or maybe even pay their VAT in Europe or UK if they're selling in those markets. In fact, one of the biggest e-commerce entrepreneur in Southeast Asia is both our client and our trusted partner too. Have you guys heard about Steve and Evan Tan? So I'm sure you guys have. <laughs> now, uh, now that you know the benefits of Payoneer and who our customers are, let me share a little bit more on how it all works. Let's start with Payin. So Payoneer helps you collect your funds in multiple currencies at no cost. So think of it like this, when you open a Payoneer account, it's like having your own local bank account in the US, UK, EU, and other major markets. Um, and it, this helps you collect payments from marketplaces like Amazon, or transfer funds from gateways like PayPal, Stripe US to check out and other payment gateways. Now, now that you have funds uh, inside Payoneer, can you conveniently pay yourself suppliers and other vendors? Well, the answer is yes, of course. So here are four ways to do that. Uh, first, you can withdraw, of course, to your bank. You're free to move your funds to a local or foreign currency bank account that you own anytime or anywhere. Second, you can make a payment, of course, to your business partners, uh, suppliers, virtual assistants, and other service providers, and you can do that in two ways, okay? So you can pay them for free uh, to their pay in your account instantly, or you can send them a bank transfer uh, at competitive rates. And also, if you work with multiple 
uh, service providers or suppliers and want to pay them in just a couple of clicks. Uh, we've also recently launched a batch payments feature that will help you do just that. Third way is through the Payoneer Debit MasterCard. So you can request for a virtual or a physical card in the currencies that we support. And you can use this to pay Facebook, Google, or other online merchants like maybe AliExpress if you're you know, in the early stages of drop shipping. And fourth way is through auto debit via our API partners. So of course at Payoneer, we've been building a large network of relevant suppliers or service providers uh, in many different areas like logistics, warehousing, software as a service, advertising, and even in the taxes space. So you can easily pay uh, these relevant service providers using your paying your balance. For example, if you're selling into markets like the EU and UK, uh, you might already know that paying VAT is mandatory. So with Payoneer, you can pay uh, the tax authority or your VAT service providers using your paying your balance for free via our VAT portal. What else? Well, of course, you can also have Payoneer on your pocket too. So easily uh, when you make your transactions anywhere you are. So to recap, here's how we can help you. Payoneer can help you maximize your e-com sales profit by saving on payment fees. You can easily make supplier payments at low cost. You can also enjoy free payments. Um, and of course, you can manage uh, all of this in one secure payments platform. And last but not the least, I'd like to invite you to learn more about our VIP program where we can offer more benefits and tailor fit a solution that's best for your business. So if you're keen to learn more about this, feel free to uh, send us a message in the Q&A box below or connect with me on LinkedIn or email as well. That's it. Thank you, guys. So let's go over to the Q&A session. Thanks so much, Ritzy. And thank you, everyone, for all the questions we've received so far. So. I'll start with Britsy already. So there are two questions for you. So the first is, um, so this person said I'm putting up a travel and tours business. How can Payoneer be my partner? Right. Um, for for your travel and tours business, do you have international clients for that? I mean, I'm happy to discuss more about this um, and see how we can help. But let's say uh, in general, if you're working with international clients um, for your business, Payoneer can provide uh, a flexible payment solution to help you collect payments uh, using debit card, bank transfer, wire transfer, and other solutions as well. So. Uh, happy to chat more later uh, to, so I can learn more about your specific need, okay? And is it possible to have two Payoneer accounts, one for pay-in and one for making payments to suppliers? So actually you don't have, you don't need to create two accounts because you can just do it in one account, right? So it makes things much easier for you because in one payner account, you can collect payments and then make payouts as well. Great. Okay, now we'll start back to all the questions around email marketing and Facebook ads. So here's a question for Joshua. Um, so this person is asking, offering a percent discount versus offering a you know, an actual dollar value, which is the better option? Well, the better option is not offer any discounts and have the same conversion rates, right? I mean, you got to keep all the profits. But the, the reality is it's it's impossible to tell. There's, there's no straight answer to that. I would recommend conducting a split test, just a side-by-side -side split test. Uh, in, in most cases, the lower, I mean, naturally lower value uh, products and lower value AOVs typically fare well with a dollar base discount uh, naturally with a higher ticket off with a high ticket item usually the the percentage one works better but that threshold is really hard to tell right 
Um, so I would really recommend just split testing it. Uh, most of the email software providers have that split testing feature. We use Klaviyo, so it's pretty easy, kind of a side-by-side 50-50 -side split test. Yeah. So someone asked about Klaviyo and um, so he, he said that his boss doesn't want to invest in Klaviyo thinking that their target audience, your mid thirties to forties don't open the emails anyway. So, you know, would email marketing still be valuable in this case? And essentially, what can I tell my boss? Oh man, that's a, that's so beautiful. I love that. Uh, that's, you know, time and time again, we, we see that with, uh, you know, you, you'd be surprised a lot of established, very successful brands that are, you know, seven, eight figures in, in yearly revenue, um, have very, very, um, underdeveloped email programs. And that's, that's often a reason that they see, but the, the reality is email is still a primary form of communication for working adults. Well, most working adults outside of China, I think. So, uh, that's, that's going to be a big part of the, their, their lives, no matter what. So if you're able to communicate them in communicate with working adults in their most kind of comfortable environment and native environment, it's, it will still be impactful when done in the right way. Right, done in kind of like the batch and blast email EDM way, that's going to be, yeah, you're probably going to be receiving some pretty negative feedback and poor results. But done in the right way, you know, 20% uh, of your total revenue driven of emails, that's not surprising to see. So you got to ask yourself, like, what, what does 20% mean to the business if you're doing a million dollars in revenue a year? That's an additional 200K left on the table. And uh, I would grab that as soon as possible. And there's another question for you, Joshua. So what's the fastest way to grow your list during Black Friday, Cyber Monday? So I clean my list down to only 4,000 engaged leads and customers. Mm, okay. Um, well, if the list is cleaned up uh, with list growth, that's a little bit tricky because list growth relies on traffic and fresh traffic. Oh, that's either, you know, true organic channels or uh, paid channels like Facebook. And that's Ho Young's specialty. So that's probably a question for Ho Young more so than, than me. But with the conversion aspect, right? Converting traffic into subscribers, that's where it can help a little bit. Uh, it's in, you know, having a good conversion, a high converting lead capture form. Uh, I would, you know, recommend having just one or two inputs, meaning just the name and email. That's about it. Make sure that it's, it has a clear, compelling offer um, on the, the, the lead capture form itself. Um, and the timing is something to, to look out for. I would split test a couple of timings. You can always use an exit in 10 timing. You can also use a trigger based on scroll, like how far down the page uh, it is, is being scrolled and then it triggers. That's also an option. Um, so yeah, test out different types of forms to convert traffic into subscribers. But yeah, Hoyung, do you have anything to add to that? Mm, no, I think one thing we recently tried uh, was to compare the the leads conversion as well. Uh, for, for some of our, I think for us, it's a bit different because like we run crowdfunding campaigns and there's a huge uh, pre-launch stage whereby, you know, sometimes we use Facebook lead ads and, yeah. um, and just, you know, landing page. Uh, we realized that the, conver the conversion rate for Facebook lead ads is dropping quite drastically for, for us, especially. We get very cheap leads. Maybe the leads uh, for Facebook lead ads is, uh, I would say, 3 to 4x, even cheaper than landing page. So that's something that, you know, uh, when we when we try for our clients, uh, usually they will say, oh, scale the heck out of it, right? Because like we haven't seen uh, 80 cents um, cost per lead for pre-launch for a product that is about $200. So, um, mm. but then the conversion rate just sort of don't add up for us, especially I think moving into second half of this year when we got, you know, some campaigns running, we, we then after that shift more of our budget back to just a pure landing page. It might be a slightly a different answer because uh, ours is, you know, pure like pre-launch and there's no sell process then. But at least yeah. from what we see, uh, Facebook lead ads don't seem to be converting very well at the back end, even though the cost is very low. Mm. Mm. All right. So now that we're talking about 
about Facebook advertising, there were a lot of questions around third party infringement and other infringement questions. So yeah. um, there's a few. So the first one is, um, do I violate it if I use the company logo where I work as an insurance agent? So I think that, uh, I think that should be fine. Uh, but then again, um, the person enforcing against you will probably be the company um, the insurance company. So uh, recently, I, I I spoke with a few um, Singapore, you know, uh, property agent, and, and they say that their company have some policy. So some company have a policy where, like, for example, they do not allow, uh, the agency does not allow the 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 agent to use their assets in the creative. So I think that depends on company to company, and the person that will probably enforce against you, uh, will be your your agency. So so I think that depends on the policy of the agency. Yeah. And. Is there also an infringement if we use influencer-generated content that created reviews about your brand? Uh, I think if it's for your brand, then you're 100% safe. And, and that's uh, something that we have been scaling up, uh, especially the start of 2020. Uh, most of our um, in-house run brands, uh, we really focus very heavily, especially for beauty products. Beauty products, uh, even some areas of consumer tech, we do a lot of influencer review um, ads, maybe even up to about 60-70% of the ad spend for a million dollar uh, brand will be on influencer ads because that's the thing that gets the most credibility. So if you are using influencers that you have endorsed, uh, then you are very safe. Uh, I think one tricky area is uh, if you are um, start just starting out, but you are extremely strong in recruiting uh, well-known influencers. So for example, we have a Chinese brand. What they did was that they managed to get like a tier one star uh, of, of the Chinese market that targets Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, almost a bit like, oh, too good to be true. Like um, that this person is using the brand and it's a very new brand. Um, then, then maybe it will make more sense for you to you know get those contract ready because once uh, Facebook flag you, just got them the contract and and most of the time it clears. So like for example, the, the client that we we'll, work with, we had their contract ready and what we anticipated that you know Facebook will flag us and once they flag us, we just you know this is the contract. Can we proceed? And then they just let us go. So I think that's uh the only thing to look out for if you are looking for talk about influencers. They are a bit more um, big scale, uh, and you, if you are a Libra. On the subject of infringement, I think uh, this one is kind of obvious. So there is a question around whether you can use swimming costumes like bikinis in Facebook ads. I think mm. it's okay unless it's not a zoom in, as Hoyoung mentioned, or you know, is there like a no, you know, uh, laundry. Bikini photo. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think it's just um these categories will generally be more tricky and you'll be prone to false positive, uh, which means that Facebook flag you even though you're okay. Um, I think like, like what you mentioned, um, no zoom in and no um exaggerated nudity. So like I think recently we've seen a lot of those very high V shape um bottoms for their for their bikini, and that. Um, in the eyes of the reviewer might seem too sexual. So um, if you are talking about bikini and, and, and laundry, if you have the head in the in the in the creative, in the asset, generally you are safe. But if it's a very sexy creative, then of course you have higher risk. Uh, and when you have a very sexy creative, the reviewer then uh, it then uh, Facebook is actually uh, maybe I can add on this part, right? Which is like there are actually two parts of the review process. The first part of the review process is usually the machine. And I think almost like more than 90% of the time, no human eyes will look at your ads. Uh, but when you go to like maybe a 10%, when you are reviewing, when you're appealing, that goes to the uh, human eyes, that goes through the human eyes. And human eyes are actually very subjective. So what is sexual to someone might not be sexual to some, someone else. So I will definitely err on the safe side, uh, have the face showing. And, and, and if you think it, it looks sexual, then it probably looks too sexual. Mm. I think, you know, in, in, in that case, it's best to use our common sense and maybe, you know, just throw it around and make sure that it's not offensive to anyone. Um, so, so that was, <coughs> excuse me, our last question. Um, do we have any other words from our, you know, our panelists today for, you know, all our e-commerce sellers who joined us tonight to really make the most out of Black Friday Cyber Monday? Uh, all the best. I hope 
hopefully Mark does not drop a band hammer on any of y'all and on us. <laughs> so uh, I think Black Friday, Saturday, Saturday, Monday, if you're just starting, um, it's really a great opportunity. Of course, you'll see in terms of Facebook site, your ad cost going up, but it's also where the conversion picks up the most as well. So it's definitely, definitely very exciting. And, and I think if you, um, I think what will nicely segue into Joshua is that do not only rely on Facebook just for your ads, right? It's definitely not the, the platform that you should have 100% focus on because after all, this is the platform that you do not own. Um, the rules can change overnight. Um, competitors come in overnight. These are all not the assets that you own. Um, of course, you can see that you know I have the pixel data. But all these things, once Facebook take away, take away. But unlike uh, your email, if you have the email list, then that belongs to you and that's your asset. So I think that's something that um, you really have to diversify away, just only, not only from using Facebook, but to explore other channels so that you have a more sustainable mix of your marketing. Yeah, and and I, I I love to to wrap up on that as well. I mean, the more the more successful your email program is, the more profits you can generate, and the more profits you can generate with that same amount of ad spend means you can spend more to acquire that same customer and essentially outspend your competitors. Uh, so, yeah, you you need both to survive and you need both to try. And yeah, all the best for Q four, man. I mean, this is a the the single silver lining for. Uh, the, the mess that is 2020. So all the best to all of you guys. And uh, yeah, if you'd like to chat, I'll be uh, around, available. Thank you so much for putting this together, Brittany and uh, Eileen, it was amazing. Thank you guys. Now we're very excited because I think this is really one of the, if not the highlight of the year for many of our e-commerce sellers. And we really wanted to, you know, share experts like yourselves to, to everyone. So thank you. And Britsy, any parting words for everybody? Well, we, we will reach out to those who have payment related questions. So thank you for those questions. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, do you want me to say something? <laughs> so thank but you. She's lost for oh, words. God, yes. <laughs> she's lost for words. Well, thank you so much, guys, for spending your evening with us. Uh, I hope you learned a lot. And yeah, for those who have questions about Pioneer, our team will reach out to you soon. So please wait for that. Um, and best of luck to your Q4. If you need a solid payment partner for your cross-border payments, uh, please feel free to contact us. Okay. And... Thank you again. So that concludes our ultimate Black Friday Cyber Monday Crash Course webinar for e-commerce sellers. My name is Eileen Borromeo. I am actually the um, head of marketing for Payneer for Southeast Asia. So please watch out for more content like these. Um, we will be releasing our Q2, Q3 um, e-commerce report soon. So that's very timely. Watch out for that next week. Um, this webinar is brought to you today by, web by Payneer. So thank you again and have a good day wherever you are. Bye guys. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Bye Thank guys. you. Take care.